Hello, everyone, and welcome to this case-based HER2 positive breast cancer panel. My name is Laura Kennedy. I'm a medical oncologist at Vanderbilt University. And I'm specializing in breast cancer, and I'm joined today by two other fabulous panelists who are going to introduce themselves, and we're going to present a case for HER2 positive breast cancer. I'm, um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Jenny Petruni. I'm a nurse practitioner. I specialize in breast medical oncology at Duke University. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Brandi Patterson. I am a cardiologist uh, also at Duke University. Okay. And I believe that Jenny is going to present our case now. Let me just make sure I can advance the slide. Um, our case, this is a 42 year old woman with two young children. In 2017, she was diagnosed with a left-sided T3N1 estrogen progesterone positive HER2 positive breast cancer. She received standard neoadjuvant chemotherapy with TCHP and she had an excellent clinical response. She went on to a right lumpectomy with sentinel lymph node biopsy. Residual disease was two centimeters in the breast and one lymph node with a micrometastasis of two millimeters. She had breast radiation, um, radiation to the breast and her regional nodes and went on to ovarian suppression with aromatase inhibition and completed HP after a year. In 2020, she developed a cough, which prompted imaging. And unfortunately, scans showed that she had a recurrence in her liver, bones, and lung. She had a liver biopsy that revealed invasive ductal carcinoma. Again, it was ERPR positive, HER2 positive. She went on to first line chemotherapy with THP for six cycles and had a complete response by imaging. So we continued her on aromatase inhibitor, ovarian suppression and HP for nine months. At that point, she developed dizziness, which prompted a brain MRI, which revealed cerebellar metastasis. Her extracranial staging with CT, chest, abdomen, pelvis revealed no evidence of disease. She had stereotactic radiosurgery to her three cerebellar lesions. And we also obtained an echocardiogram, which showed her EF was 45%. Um, she was asymptomatic. Um, however, her EF was decreased. So the question is, what is the next best step in her therapy? So I suspect it was probably a left-sided breast cancer and it was actually a left-sided lumpectomy. I think there probably was just a typo on the slides. So I'm gonna to touch base quickly on you know, this case, which now is three years old and a lot of things have changed in her two positive breast cancer since 2017. And um, you know, this was a relatively young woman. She received appropriate neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And at that time, you know, when patients had residual disease at time of surgery, you know, we continued on with standard adjuvant therapy because we didn't have any of the new data that we have now to address, to make a shift basically, to try to address the fact that, you know, patients that don't respond well to neoadjuvant chemotherapy are very high risk for recurrence. So unfortunately this lady, you know, she had two centimeters of residual disease at time of surgery. And so she was at high risk for recurrence despite the fact that she got optimal, optimal therapy for the time. So if you would advance for me, Jenny. Yep. So. So now we, you know, based on the Catherine trial, we actually know that, you know, for patients who have residual disease at time of surgery after get completing neoadjuvant chemotherapy, that actually TDM1 or Catsila is the optimal treatment for them um, post uh, surgery. So this was a study looking at patients who were randomized to either TDM1 or Herceptin as their adjuvant treatment. And what you can see is that you know, in terms of freedom from distant recurrence, that TDM1 was a superior drug compared to Herceptin. And so the standard of care for this lady, if she had been treated in 2021, would be that instead of going on to adjuvant Herceptin, she would have gotten um, adjuvant TDM1 for nine months. Next slide, please. So, um, and so now we have a patient who unfortunately has recurred um, despite the fact that she got optimal therapy for the time. She got first-line treatment with THP, which is still the first-line therapy. She actually had a beautiful response, as many of these patients do initially. Um, but the reality is that paclitaxel, Herceptin, and Pertuzumab do not cross the blood-brain barrier. 
And so she had a CNS only recurrence, which is also a very common um, tale with these HER2 positive breast cancer patients. So in terms of thinking about a patient who had first line treatment, who is progressing, and one of the, the recent presentations at ESMO was actually, there is now a new standard of care for the second line treatment. And this is for systemic progression, but that study was looking at TDM1, which was the previous second line standard of care versus tristuzumab deruxatecan, which is antibody drug conjugate. And that actually showed a significantly improved progression-free survival in the second line setting. And so now um, most of the patients who progress after initial THP are going to get trastuzumab deruxatecan. For this lady, it's harder to know if that's the right choice for her because systemically she doesn't have any disease right now. She only has CNS only disease. So if you go to the next slide, Jenny. Um, so for her, one of the things that we would probably think about is, you know, should we apply the HER2 climb data to her? So that was a study that was looking at um, patients and the treatment that they received was tucatinib, which is a HER2 targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitor in combination with Herceptin or trastuzumab and capecitabine. And they compared it to the standard through line treatment at the time, which was trastuzumab and capecitabine. You could also argue that lapatinib and capecitabine might've been an appropriate control arm for this. Um, but what they saw was that there was a superior progression-free survival for tucatinib, trastuzumab, and capecitabine. But not only that, patients who had CNS disease had significant benefit from this particular treatment regimen. And so for this patient who had CNS only, who had CNS only recurrent, this may be a reasonable treatment regimen to consider for her. Um, you know, the other thing you could consider is since she has no evidence of systemic disease, we've now treated her CNS metastases would you consider a de-escalated version of this where you just give her tucatinib and herceptin or trastuzumab or just tucatinib? And that is a question that um, there is no trial to answer and that is clinical practice, but that is what a lot of us thinking about, think about when we're treating these patients. Next slide, Jenny. So I think, you know, the things that I think I'm thinking about right now as a medical oncologist and just with the new data that just came out from ESMO is, you know, so now, in terms of sequencing our treatment for these HER2 positive breast cancer patients. Um, I think that, you know, the first line of therapy is still THP for the time being. Um, for the second line of treatment, I think most of us now would offer trastuzumab deruxatecan. And then for third line, I suppose a lot of us might consider TDM1. Um, although we don't really know after trastuzumab deruxatecan how much activity TDM1 really has. And the other aspect of this is, you know, now with the Catherine trial and a lot of patients getting TDM1 in the adjuvant setting, you know, would you really treat a patient who previously had received adjuvant TDM1, you know, with third line TDM1 in the metastatic setting? And the answer is maybe not. Um, so it's becoming less clear to me necessarily what um, the next move would be after trastuzumab deruxatecan. Certainly to catinib, trastuzumab and capecitabine would be something that we could consider and we talked a little bit about, you know, thinking about how should we sequence all these different things for these patients when they have CNS only versus CMS and systemic disease based on the current data. So I think for the next portion, um, Jenny's going to present a little bit of information about the tecatinib capecitabine trastuzumab regimen, because it does have some notable side effects being triple therapy. And then I think actually Dr. Patterson is going to talk a little bit about ejection fraction and monitoring ejection fraction in these patients and what we should do when their ejection fraction is reduced in these patients, because that is also something that very commonly happens because we are monitoring patients on HER2-directed therapies with echocardiograms every three months. So Jenny, take it away. Thank you. Um, so for the HER2-CLIMB, we call it the HER2-CLIMB regimen because that was the name of the clinical trial that showed pretty significant benefit um, to using to catnib with capecitabine and trastuzumab. The adverse reactions, the most prominent are GI um, side effects. So patients that are on the dual therapy with the oral to catnib and oral capecitabine have significantly increased diarrhea, um, nausea, and vomiting. And those are um, side effects that for some patients have to be pretty aggressively managed and sometimes we have to dose reduce either the tecatinib or the capecitabine in order for patients to tolerate the regimen. Um, other side effects, the PPE syndrome is the most common side effect with capecitabine. Um, fatigue, 
stomatitis, decreased appetite. And then also with the tacatinib, you can see elevation in the liver function test. So that's something that we monitor monthly while patients are on this um, particular regimen. So, you know, usually they're coming in every three weeks for their IV trastuzumab. And because a lot of patients have so many side effects, we usually see them every three weeks to try, at least in the beginning, to try to help them with the GI associated toxicity and to get them on a dose that they're able to tolerate. I also just wanted to mention the um, side effects for the trastuzumab Durexican. Um, as um, Dr. Kennedy mentioned, now that it's going to likely become second line for many of our metastatic patients, and it's a new drug, it's good for us to, to think about the side effects so we can educate our patients um, the biggest one is that there's a black box, box warning for interstitial lung disease. And that is something that um, in my practice, we take very seriously. Um, our pharmacist and our pulmonologists were able to come together and develop a guideline where we actually check PFTs and CT every other cycle for these patients to try to identify um, early pneumonitis. The, and you know, in the, in the first trial, there were, I think, four or five deaths related to the interstitial lung disease. But then in Destiny 03, there weren't any, hopefully because now that we're aware of this and we can monitor for it, we can prevent. Once a patient is grade two, the recommendation is actually to stop therapy. Um, other side effects include alopecia. Grade one is most common. Um, clinically, I have seen quite a bit of hair thinning with this regimen, fatigue, nausea and vomiting. So we use our moderate metagenesis Genesis, sorry, can't say that word, with dexamethasone and undansetron. Um, also diarrhea, constipation, usually grade one, not, um, not too significant. Neutropenia, we have had to add growth factor to many of our patients. And again, cardiotoxicity, considering it's a HER2 directed therapy. So I'm gonna pause just a minute because we have a couple questions, I think, from the audience. So there was one question about considering continuation of THP, so pertuzumab, trastuzumab, and taxine for this patient since she only had CNS, disease with no systemic progression. And then the next person kind of asked a correlate question, which is, would you choose uh, the tacatinib? I'm assuming they mean the tacatinib, capecitabine, and trastuzumab over in HER2 in this patient. So I think that those are both fair questions. I think that you could approach this one of two ways. You could make the argument that you have definitively treated what's in her brain for right now um, and continue to surveil that. And you could potentially actually just put her back on HP plus endocrine therapy because she's been stable on that and see how things go in terms of surveillance, you know, following MRI brains with her. So that would be one thing you could think about doing. Um, I think that, you know, if a lot of people feel like when patients have CNS progression, like they have CNS only disease, that suggests that you didn't really have that great of systemic control. Um, and so, I've seen what we typically do here is we actually consider using tacatinib because it does cross the blood brain barrier over in HER2. Although Jenny's going to present some really interesting things about the trastuzumab durexatecan kind of at the end of the presentation, just in terms of what kind of activity that may have in CNS only disease. So stay tuned. So now I'll pass off Dr. Patterson. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So HER2 targeted therapies can be associated with cardiotoxicity, which is usually asymptomatic and reversible. However, current guidelines limit the use of HER2 targeted therapies to patients with LVEF within the institutional limits of normal and recommend that significant changes in EF lead to a temp temporary interruption or even treatment discontinuation. However, we know that the impact of withholding these therapies on breast cancer outcomes is associated with increased risk of breast cancer relapse and cancer death. So Safe Heart is the first prospective study that reported on the cardiac safety of patients with compromised heart function receiving HER2 targeted therapy for breast cancer. And it had a median follow-up of about 3.5 years. So initially 30 patients with stage one through four HER2 positive breast cancer receiving trastuzumab with or without pertuzumab or TDM1 with either new or pre-existing asymptomatic EF decline. And that was, just, that was 
basically 40 to 49%, which puts this patient right in that category. Um, these patients were started on cardioprotective medications such as carvedilol and either an ACE or an angiotensin receptor blocker. The primary endpoint was completion of HER2 therapy without cardiac events, which they defined as decompensated heart failure, MI, sudden cardiac death, or asymptomatic worsening of EF, which was defined as a drop in EF of 10% or greater and or an absolute decrease to an EF of less than 35%. So echoes were performed regularly um, after the last dose of HER2 and treat at the end of treatment evaluation and six months later. So IRB approved long-term follow-up um, assessment in 23 patients. Three patients died from disease progression. Two patients declined consent. Two were lost to follow-up. And that was from the initial group of, of 30. Of the 23 patients that were followed long-term, nine of them had metastatic disease and 14 had early stage breast cancer. Um, the study met its primary endpoint. Of the 23 patients, only two had cardiac events. One had symptomatic heart failure, which improved, um, but died of disease progression, unfortunately. Another had early stage disease and an asymptomatic EF decline to 35% after she self-discontinued her cardiac medications. Once she was put back on the cardiac medications, then her EF improved. And so three of the nine metastatic patients were on both trastuzumab and pertuzumab. 14 of the group of 23 patients in long-term follow-up uh, actually had previously received anthracyclines, which is about 60% of them. So with cardioprotection, um, SafeHeart showed us that the LVEF actually improved from 44.9% up to 52.1%, including patients on prior anthracycline and those who remained on HER2. So overall, a big bonus for us for, for implementing cardioprotection in this patient, in the case discussion, and those who have in particular an EF, definitely between the 40 and 50% range that are asymptomatic. Um, the SCHOLAR trial was a similar study, but only with 20 patients and basically confirmed the findings of safe heart. NSABP B31 is a large randomized phase three adjuvant trial that has shown in patients without underlying cardiac disease at baseline, the addition of TRAS to adjuvant chemo really didn't result in long-term worsening cardiac function. Um, if you don't mind, Jeannie, going to the next slide, please. So looking at this next slide, um, trastuzumab induced cardiotoxicity, review of clinical risk factors, pharmacologic prevention and cardiotoxicity of other HER2-directed therapies. Basically, the gist of this was that um, there are certain patients with cardiovascular risk factors. Um, advanced age is one of the most important risk factors for cardiovascular toxicity and previous anthracycline treatment. Um, so these patients, um, in combination with trastuzumab, are at much higher risk of cardiotoxicity. AC is actually at the highest risk, higher than age. Um, cardiotoxicity rates of other HER2 therapies, such as pertuzumab and TDM1, appear to be lower. And trifenia and berenice were basically undertaken to specifically evaluate the cardiac tolerability of AC sparing regimens given uh, with HER2 targeted therapy. So in the phase two trifenia, cardiac dysfunction, which was defined as an EF decline of less than 10% from a baseline, to less than 50% accrued in about 16% of the FEC, of the patients receiving FEC, fluorouracil, epirubicin, and cyclophosphamide, and then sequential trastuzumab and pertuzumab. 11% in um, the FEC with concurrent trastuzumab and pertuzumab, and about 12% in um, the dox, doc, <laughs> docotox, doxyl, doxyl, I'm sorry, carboplatinum and the concurrent trastuzumab and pertuzumab. And the phase two Berenice study basically evaluated cardiac uh, safety and taxane and AC-based regimens. And patients received either dose-dense doxorubicin and cyclophosphamide followed by weekly paclitaxel or FEC followed by doclotoxyl. <clears throat> 
All patients receive the taxane therapy with concurrent pertuzumab and trastuzumab for an entire year. And the cardiac event rates were actually pretty low, but more prevalent in the DDAC arm, which would be expected. Um, and they experienced NYHA class three, four heart failure uh, events um, more readily than the others. Um, about 6.5% in the DDAC group um, compared to 2% in the FEC group experienced a decline in EF of greater than 10%. Um, as I said, most declines are reversible and improved at the next visit, especially with the right cardioprotection. And so I think that the evidence really isn't there to, at this point, um, necessarily start patients on cardioprotection um, with minimal cardiovascular risk factors, um, no ACE use, uh, unless their EF starts to decrease into that sort of 40 to 50% range, even if they are, are asymptomatic. I think the Safe Heart trial really proved to us that cardioprotection can help improve EF and thereby um, really increasing the chances of breast cancer patient survival, because the last thing any cardiologist wants to do is have the breast cancer therapy stopped, because we know of the risk of progression and the risk for cancer death uh, goes up, um, you know. So I think overall, if there's ever a question about whether it's the right time to start cardioprotection, I think reaching out to cardiology colleagues for input um, is always welcome. I mean, we are always here to help uh, think through and look through each and every case uh, individually. And um, in some patients, it, it really can be life-saving. That's super interesting. I think we do have a couple more questions in the panel or, or from the audience. One was about getting um, baseline PFTs. Jenny, do you want to answer that one? Is the question, should we? I think actually the package insert does recommend baseline PFTs. And then what we've decided to do at our institution, I think just to be really cautious, is we get um, PFTs and a non-contrast interstitial lung disease specific CT scan um, every other cycle, at least for the first six to eight cycles just to monitor closely for pneumonitis. But I do think the baseline PFTs are pretty important because that way, um, you know, wh while you're monitoring, um, you'll have that baseline to compare back to. Oh, great answer. And then I think we had one question about a patient who progressed on TCHP and it sounds like then they were on HP maintenance and they got neurotinib. And then they were on TDM1 and they're still progressing. They've also received endocrine therapy. It sounds like it had progression. You know, what kinds of therapies would you choose next? I think some of it just depends on um, the patient and what they're able to tolerate. I think keep sight of being trusted to and to catnip would be a logical third line therapy, you know, and then maybe um, trust to map taken after that. But, you know, certainly you want to modulate whatever you give them to their, to their ability to tolerate the regimen, the ticatinib regimen is a harder one to, to manage in terms of side effects as Jenny presented. So that probably would be my next choice for that person. So Brandy, is there any, um, any case where you would say that you definitely need to start stop the HER2-directed therapy you know, for cardiac symptoms? Are there any scenarios where potentially we would stop for patients? Yeah, I think that if they're presenting with signs and symptoms of decompensated heart failure um, and the patient needs to be stabilized, um, you know, that would be an, an, an ischemia, but usually it's more of, you know, decompensated heart failure symptoms that, that comes up more frequently than ischemia. Um, so yes, I, I think that would be one particular case if the patient is symptomatic. Um, that I would consider stopping it uh, for a period of time until the patient is stabilized. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. We really enjoyed being with you. Um, you know, please feel free to reach out and contact us at our respective institutions if you have questions that are specific.